Uh, we got into uh, AC, alternating current. We started looking at different ways to um, uh, look at the alter alternating current signal, whether that was you know, on a, a vertical axis. And so we were looking at the width Right. And so uh, we, we talked about things like the period, meaning the distance in time of one cycle. Uh, we talked about uh, the frequency, which was you know, measured in hertz. You know, it was the number of cycles per second. Um, and then we also talked about how we could look at uh, the vertical component of AC, um, you know, either peak voltage or peak to peak voltage. And we talked about some other values. You know, when we measure with our meter, we're actually going to get RMS, root mean square, uh, and and you could even do a an average voltage. And so all of those will come into play as we continue to to move forward. Any questions about stuff that we've covered to this point that we might want to just go back and and uh, maybe review. Okay, if, if you happen to think of something, just let me know. And we always can either go back as a class and review it, or uh, you know, I can set aside some time to um, work with anyone who wants you know, a little bit more uh, personal attention as well. So we're into session five. You know, we're on Monday of, this is a, the third week now, so session five. And we're going to get into, you know, we talked about AC last Wednesday, alternating current. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, inductance, so AC inductance. You know, up to this point, all we've talked about in terms of components have been resistors, and we said resistors oppose uh, current flow, and you know, now we're going to get into uh, inductors. And so let me pop over here to this. All right. Everybody see AC inductance? Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so when we talked about, you know, resistors and we started off saying what resistors do, resistors uh, oppose um, current flow. Well, we're going to get into inductance and, and talk about inductance and how we measure and how we calculate inductance. Uh, in this section, we're going to try to define inductance. We're going to look at what we're going to call inductive reactance. Um, we're going to take a look at some formulas. Uh, we're going to look at some different factors that affect inductance. We're also going to, for the first time, talk about a phase relationship. Uh, you know, up until this point, we've, we've mentioned phase relationship, but we've said everything is in phase. You know, we looked at AC alternating current with a resistive circuit, and we mentioned phase relationship, but we said that it was in phase. And so this will be the first time when we see an out of phase relationship or a, a shift in that relationship between current and voltage. <clears throat> we'll take a look at some uh, filters. And we'll also look at how do we calculate a, a impedance of an RL, RL being a resistive inductive circuit, right? So uh, one of the first things we have to do when we talk about inductance, <clears throat> inductance is the ability to, of a device or an inductor to oppose the change in current flow. We talked about resistors oppose current, right? You put it in the circuit and it opposes current. It's always there. Really, uh, no matter uh, what's happening with the current, it's a steady uh, uh, value of resistance, right? And so um, you know, it, 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 uh, it opposes current the same throughout. You know, whether the current is changing or whether the current is steady, it's still a set value. With inductance, and we're going we're gonna to talk about why this, is, this happens, but 
With inductance, what we have is this device that creates opposition to a change in current flow. And so it really wants to maintain a steady current flow. It doesn't want current to be changing, right? And so anytime current changes, it provides opposition to that change in current flow. We'll see it. Um, it says induction is the action of a C EMF, counter EMF with a change in current. Uh, it's measured in Henry, which will be abbreviated H, uh, either a large H or a small H. And it's also, um, it's dependent on a couple different factors, right? The number of turns in a coil, the size of, of a conductor, and what type of core it has. We, when we take a look at one of these, you'll, it'll make a little bit more sense. You know, here is an example. So when we talk about inductance, what happens around a, a, a conductor, and you may remember when we were looking at meters, and we were talking about current, and we said that there is, um, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to measure current in a circuit because we need the current to flow through the meter. And so typically that would mean that we have to break the circuit and place the meter in the circuit to allow current to flow through. But there was another meter, remember that clamp on meter, that, that uh, meter that would actually open up and you could clamp it around a conductor. What did I do with your tiny ass? I, 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 That's right. What happened. And so, if we clap clamp it around the conductor, we could get a measurement. Now, what we found was that measurement really it wasn't a measure so much of current; it was a measure of the uh, magnetic field that exists around a conductor that has current flowing through it. Okay, and so if I have you know, a, a, uh, a wire and I have current flowing through the wire. Well, around this wire, I'll get this magnetic field. It will expand, you know, the strength of the magnetic field will be dependent upon um, the, the amount of current that, that is flowing. Now, another thing that also um, impacts the strength of the, the uh, magnetic field is the number of turns and by turns, I just mean simply a, a, a twist of the wire. I mean, you can see here we've got, you know, a turn. This wire has been twisted. And as I increase the number of turns, it increases the magnetic field around that conductor in this area. You know, I've got more turns and that current that's flowing through. It just makes sense that the more turns I have, the more uh, strength the magnetic field is going to have. And so the same thing here. You can see this is three turns. And you can see how the magnetic field is increasing. Every time I add turns to this, this conductor, I get um, you know, more turns, an increase in the magnetic field uh, around the turns. Are right. you showing anything? Move the slide because you're still on the title page. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like I can see the, the preview on the side, but I'm, and I'm pretty sure that's what you're talking about. <laughs> so let me uh, let me stop sharing it and uh, see if I can share it again. <laughs> yeah, you should be seeing something a little different than the title page. What about now? Do you see? Uh, there we go. Hey. Look, does that look better? <laughs> what the heck is this guy day. talking about? <laughs> All right, so um, you can see here these, these three pictures. Well, hopefully you can see here these three pictures. Well, we've got, you know, one turn, two turns, three turns. And as I increase the, the number of turns, it's going to increase this magnetic field around the turns, right? I mean, it just it just makes sense if I've got – you know, and, and you, you guys, you've probably done this at, at some point in time, but, uh, you know, if you take a, uh, a screwdriver and, uh, you, you, you uh, wrap a wire around a screwdriver and then you uh, cause a current to flow through that screwdriver, right? Negative, positive, it goes through all those turns. Those turns are wrapped around the, the metal portion of the screwdriver and it magnetizes the screwdriver. 
It won't last for a long period of time. But, you know, if you if you can't reach a, uh, a screw, you've dropped it somewhere. It's a nice little trick to be able to, you know, uh, be able to pick it up. Well, the more turns you have, uh, the stronger the magnetic field will be uh, for any given current. And you've just got, like I said, more turns and that magnetic field just combines on itself. Now, what it's telling you here at the bottom of this slide, it's talking about these uh, time constants. It takes five time constants for an inductor to reach its maximum current flow. Uh, for a formula calculating the time constants, TC time constant is equal to L divided by R. Now L, first of all, we haven't even told you what L is yet. Uh, L is the letter that we're gonna use when we're talking about inductance. Makes perfect sense, right? You know, inductance, uh, let's use an L. Well, the reason we're gonna use an L is because we can't use an I, right? We've been using I for current or, you know, what we typically, the way we remember that is we're talking about intensity or current. And so now we're using an L for inductance, right? And so what it's saying is this time constant you know, and it's, it's, it's not something to, to really get hung up on, but, but basically what it's saying is that they're going to take whatever the time is for the circuit, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at this in circuit, and we'll see that depending on, um, you know, the values of L and R, this is going to take longer for this um, magnetic field to reach its strength or discharge, because it's going to, it's actually going to increase. It's going to build around that conductor. And then it's going to decrease as the, the, the uh, current in that conductor changes direction. And keep in mind, we're talking about AC, right? And so we get that current that starts at zero and it increases up. You know, voltage increases and this, this inductor is trying to oppose the change in current flow. So we get this current that's trying to change, it opposes the change, but it builds up to some maximum potential. And then the polarity switches. Well, when the polarity switches, this magnetic field around the conductor will then collapse. And when it collapses, you know, just as this phenomena of inductance where we get a magnetic field around a conductor um, with current flowing through that conductor, we get this magnetic field. This, the reverse is true. Whenever you have a magnetic field around a conductor and that magnetic field collapses, well, it will cause current flow in that wire. And so this polarity of AC that's changing back and forth because, you know, uh, AC is, is changing, you know, it's going in one direction and then it goes back below that X axis and goes in the other direction. So the polarity is changing. And as the polarity is changing, when you have a device like an inductor, you get this magnetic field that is expanding around the, conduct, the uh, inductor and then collapsing. And it expands in the opposite direction and then collapses. It expands, collapses. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, building and then collapsing all the while trying to maintain a constant uh, current. You know, it opposes the change in current flow. And it'll do that. It'll expand or it will collapse over five time constants. And then we can use this formula to figure out, well, how long is a time constant? You're, you're probably not gonna have to do a whole lot of these calculations, but it's just, um, you know, it's good to see what they're talking about uh, in terms of, of time constants. Um, you know, and, and it's not a set time. You know, I don't want you to think that, well, a time constant is, is four seconds. And so it's gonna take, you know, four, five second time constant or five, four second time constants for it to charge and discharge. No, it's going to, it's going to change based on the values of the inductor and the value of the resistor. And, and once we get to a circuit, we'll look at why it changes um, and what causes that change. So during the first time constant current will charge to 63.2% uh, of the maximum value, and it'll continue that percentage every time, you know, and it's, and it's, you know, each little block is smaller and smaller in terms of the amount of additional charge that, that we will see. So let's, it looks like this, right? If I have an inductor and I've got a, um, 
inductor that's going to build, this magnetic field is going to build over these five time constants, right? One, two, three, four, and five. You can see that they've actually given you a graph here that talks about, um, well, yeah, it gives you six, a six. But, you know, by the time we get here, we're at 99.3%. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, you're so close at that point, you might as well say that it's, it's fully charged. You actually may even see some references to uh, fewer time constants or, or more. But you can see what's happening here. In that first time constant, it goes from zero as we get current, that magnetic field begins to build and it goes from zero to that 63.2% of total, right? Then every time constant, it's gonna be an additional 63.2%. Well, it's 63.2% of what's left, right? And so it goes from 63.2% to 86.5% to 95% to 98.2% to 99.3%. And so here, we're just gonna, you know, say that's fully charged. In terms of the formula, you can see we're, uh, we're looking at, you know, this time constant, you know, TC, usually what you'll see here uh, is equal to uh, L divided by R. And so um, my inductor was five millihenries divided by one kilo ohm, which gives me, you know, five microseconds. Right, five microseconds is, is what we're looking at here. In terms of discharge, let's say I have a, you know, the polarity shifts, and now that magnetic field that has expanded across that inductor, that coil of wire, um, now it begins to collapse, and it's going to go in five time constants. It's going to completely uh, collapse or um, you may hear some people say discharge, but typically discharge, we're talking about capacitors, but you're going to see something that's really similar with capacitors. And so you might even hear somebody talk about this magnetic field discharging, but, um, you know, five time constants, it's going from 100, you know, in one time constant, we're already, you know, this is basically 63.2 is what has been discharged. So we're left with 36.8. And we're going to continue that 13.5, 5, 5 1.8, and you got 0.7 left, right? And so that's what's happening with this, this inductor that we've got in circuit, this coil um, of wire that we have in circuit. As the, the uh, current changes, it's either going to uh, charge or discharge, right? Uh, from from the very beginning, as soon as we apply power, you know it's it's a it's nothing but a coil of wire. It's going to have to charge up, and then that magnetic field is going to expand. In other words, and uh, and it will hold there. Let's say we put a, um, you know, a, a conductor in a DC circuit. Well, it's going to see that opposition uh, to change of current flow because as soon as you apply power, you're going to get current in. The, uh, the circuit, and it's going to begin to expand. And then as long as there's not a change in current flow, that magnetic field will hold steady. But when you have a change, you know, if it, if it changes a little, then you'll see this drop down. But typically, when, especially when we're talking about AC, what's going to happen is it's going to change polarity. And when it changes polarity, well, then this capacitor which has a capacitor this inductor which has this magnetic field around it is then going to uh, have that magnetic field collapse and when it does it's going to force current uh, in the the conductor to try to hold current the same and so you're going to see it collapse and the magnetic magnetic field is going to go down to basically zero and then begin to expand in the opposite direction because the polarity has changed right and so you're going to you're going to get that a constant expand, collapse, expand, collapse, expand, collapse with an AC circuit because it is constantly changing polarity. All right. Now we can put inductors uh, in series and we can put them in parallel um, just like we did with resistors. 
And the interesting thing is they, they really follow uh, resistors uh, in terms of mathematically. Uh, if you look at inductors in series, all I have to do is add those inductors together. If I want to look at, you know, this is total inductance. If I had three inductors in a series circuit, I just add those three together and I get total inductance. That's the same formula that we saw with resistors, right? If I had resistors in a series circuit, I could just add those resistors together and I get you know, my total resistance. For uh, inductors in parallel, same thing holds true as it did for resistors. You know, I've got the reciprocal of the sum of reciprocal formula, you know, where I can once again go one over one over L1 plus one over L2, one over L3, however many uh, inductors I have to calculate my total inductance in a parallel circuit. <clears throat> okay, so this, this is actually, it's talking a little bit about what some things that I've already mentioned uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in order for you to have this phenomenon, you, know, you need a conductor, you got a magnetic field, and if you got motion between the two, then it generates current, right? Motion between the two, meaning that if I've got a conductor and uh, you know, I'm either moving the conductor or I'm moving the magnetic field, you know, when the, the, um, what happens with the counter EMF is that magnetic field begins to move. When current starts to flow in an inductive circuit, the magnetic lines of force start to expand. And when we first get current, remember that inductor opposes the change in current flow. And so if it's sitting there at no current and then I begin to get current, it, it opposes that change. And so you begin to get that expansion of the, uh, the magnetic field. It generates this counter EMF 180 degrees out of phase with the conductor, which opposes applied voltage. This continues for a brief period of time. It takes... Uh, for the current flow to reach its maximum, you know, those five time constants um, with the current at a maximum value, there's no longer any expanding of the magnetic field around the conductor and CMF decreases. So, you know, once you get that, that maximum value, you know, once you get current, you know, current is the same and it's, it's not changing, then um, you don't get any more expansion of the, um, the, uh, the, magnetic field. Now, if you take a look at, at this group of, of um, you know, what looks like a, a, a plate of spaghetti, if you look at the dash lines here, that is our applied voltage. And you may remember we talked about current and voltage being in uh, phase in phase and you see here we've got our voltage at its peak right there's a peak value and we've got current at zero so we apply voltage current is at zero and what has to happen is this current because there's that magnetic field that is going to expand and you know that that expansion of that magnetic field what it takes to expand that opposes the change in current flow and so there's some opposition there and so it doesn't immediately go to you know this max value as soon as the voltage is applied it takes some time and so it's it's you know building all the while our current is our, our voltage our applied voltage is falling right in fact, we get to the point where our voltage is at zero, but our current is at a peak, and then it begins to fall, right? And once again, it's that, it's that uh, field that's around the inductor that it is collapsing that tries to maintain that, that you know, um, steady current. That, so we're here, even though the, the current is falling, I mean, even though the voltage is falling. And then the same thing continues as we change polarity. So we go below the x-axis here. So now we've changed polarity. Well, you can see as we change polarity, we get this decrease in current. 
And then it begins to build the magnetic field, the currents building, you know, magnetic fields going in the opposite direction. And so, and, and basically what you see here is that my current, and it's easiest to look at the peaks and look at the zero values. And so if I look at the peak, my current is out of phase with my voltage. It's no longer max voltage, like in a resistive circuit, max voltage equals max current. You know, there's, there's an element here due to the opposition of change in current where they are no longer in phase. You know, here's the, the other piece of that, looking at the um, magnetic field, this counter EMF that's building around the inductor. We said it was 180 degrees out of phase. And so therefore, as this, you know, we start off, we got voltage, where we're building that, that um, actually, that's, that's probably not a good place to look at it just because uh, it's at this max value. <clears throat> and if we look at, let's say we start here. No, let's say we start here. So we've got our applied voltage at zero. You know, as our polarity and our voltage, and this is a different polarity here, but as our voltage builds, we can see that counter EMF builds in the opposite direction. Right. And so they're 180 degrees out of phase, which means they're, you know, one's at a positive peak when the other's at a negative peak. And they're going to cancel out. And what we wind up with when we look at all this for inductors, remember this L represents an inductor. We get this nice little saying, Eli the Iceman. This actually applies to both inductors and capacitors, but an inductor, E, remember E represented voltage and I represented current. So E leads current, voltage leads current by 90 degrees. Okay, so voltage, my voltage, right, leads current, meaning it's, a, it's ahead of the current by 90 degrees. And you can see that you know, 90 degrees is one quarter right? If 360 degrees is a full loop, 180 is, is, you know, half, 90 degrees is one quarter. And so right here is what we're talking about in terms of 90 degrees, right? And so you can see my voltage is already at its peak. It's leading my current. It is where my current will be, but it's 90 degrees ahead, right? So it's at peak, 90 degrees later, my current's at peak. And if we take this point, voltage is at zero. Well, 90 degrees later, my current is at zero. Right. And so Eli, voltage leads current by 90 degrees. Now, just, just so we can, and we'll we'll bring this slide up again when we're talking about capacitors. But here with capacitors you know, represented by C, it's just the opposite. Current leads voltage by 90 degrees. And we'll see that once we get the capacitors. But right now we've got this inductor, nothing more than a coil of wire. And as we have current, you know, voltage is applied, we get an opposition to uh, current flow because this magnetic field, this counter EMF that's building, and it's gonna continue to oppose the change in current flow. And, and anytime we get this, and you can see one of the things about uh, AC, you know, alternating current, uh, we look at the voltage, this is AC voltage, it's constantly changing. You know, when we looked at DC, DC was a straight line. You know, if it was nine volts, it was nine volts steady across. You know, here, it's constantly changing. Let's, let's, I mean, let's say that was nine, nine volts uh, AC. Well, it's going from nine to seven to six. I mean, it's constantly changing zero, then it's changing polarity going the opposite direction. And so this inductor, um, this inductor, as current, as voltage changes, as the current in the wire changes, is providing some opposition to that change based fully on this notion of inductance and that magnetic field that's, that's being generated. Now, in terms of Ohm's law, now, we mentioned that you can use 
the same formulas if you're going to calculate total inductance or in series, you know, it's, you know, I just add my inductors together. If you're going to calculate uh, total um, inductance in parallel, it's the reciprocal of the sum of reciprocals. You know, it's, it's just like resistors. There is a little bit of a difference in terms of what we mean by inductance and thinking about resistance. You know, when we talked about resistance, resistance was the resistance that we, we uh, use when we're talking about Ohm's law. Remember, voltage is equal to current times resistance. Resistance meant uh, the, the resistor values when we added those up. Inductance has another value, another uh, a, a measurement that really is closely aligned to resistance. And it's this notion of X with a subscript L, so X sub L. And what we call that is not so much resistance, but we call it reactance, right? And so X sub L is known as inductive because I've got this you know, subscript of L, inductive reactance, right? Inductive reactance. And I can use inductive reactants just as I use um, resistance in Ohm's law, right? You know, here, if we solve Ohm's law you know, for current, remember current was equal to voltage divided by resistance. Well, this is the same thing. Current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. Well, the resistive value I would use for when I'm talking about inductance or inductors would be uh, inductive reactants or X sub L, right? Now, how do we figure X sub L out? How do we get that value? What, how do we know what the inductive rea reactants or the AC opposition of these uh, inductors, what they actually are? Well, one of the things that we have to take in, into consideration is uh, frequency. Right. And think about what we what we meant by frequency. We said frequency was uh, closely aligned to um, the period. You know, so in other words, the, the amount of time it took for uh, one wave. Right. We said frequency is the, the reciprocal of that you know, frequency measured in hertz, the number of cycles per second. Um, as we get change in current flow, the more change, the more inductive reactance, right? So, so the, the, if inductive reactance is, if it's like resistance, right? let's say that those two are uh, uh, closely aligned because I can use both of those in Ohm's law. Well, my inductive reactance or my you know, resistance for inductors changes based on the amount of change. Remember we said that inductors, they change or they oppose the change in current flow, right? They oppose the change. So it's that change. And the more change you have, the greater the inductive reactance. Well, think about what, what that means in terms of frequency. If frequency is the number of cycles per second, if we've got one cycle per second, you know, that's, that's a certain amount of change. And we said that, you know, with this AC, it's going to be changing uh, over that entire sine wave. But the rate of change is definitely less with one cycle per second than if I had a thousand cycles per second, right? If I have a thousand cycles per second, so I'm dealing with one kilohertz. Now I've got, you know, a lot of change compared to one cycle per second. Well, the more change that you have, the more frequency you have, the greater your inductive reactance. Remember when we talked about uh, directly proportional or inversely proportional, you know, what this formula tells us is that inductive reactance is directly proportional to frequency. In other words, as frequency goes up, my inductive reactance is gonna increase. It's gonna go up. They're directly proportional. As my inductance 
goes up. So think of the inductance as the ability of this device to oppose uh, uh, changes in current. And so as its ability to oppose changes in current increases, then so will my inductive reactance. And so a change in either one of those is going to show a corresponding change in inductive reactants. If my frequency goes down, I'm going to have less inductive reactants. If my inductor goes down, the value of in inductance uh, goes down, then my inductive reactants, the value is going to go uh, decrease as well. It's all about that change. All right, so let's, let's just take a look at um, these circuits and see if we can make a little bit of sense out of what might happen here. Um, both of these are you know, filter circuits. And what we have is our EA, so our voltage applied. We've got uh, an inductor. You can see that inductor, this is the schematic symbol of an inductor. It's just representing those coils of wire, those turns of wire, if you will. And, you know, it's in series. Then we have this uh, resistor. And we've got a couple outputs over that resistor. And so we've got this you know, voltage applied. This is a, uh, a you know, a AC voltage. And we'll see what happens with this um, inductor. And we've got this waveform, this corresponding, corresponding waveform. This is looking at the, um, you know, the peak output or the, the output across the resistance here. I think that's what we're looking at. Yeah, and so <clears throat> what it's showing you here is uh, at the frequency where the output voltage to 70.7, this is what they're going to call the half power point. Uh, this is also, and, and, and we'll take a look at um, decibels later, but they also call this half power point, this 0 0.707 or 3 dB. And that's what they're going to deem is um, unusable. And so everything up here is going to be good. And then beyond that is is going to be you know, our, our um, cutoff. You know, this is going to be our cutoff frequency, right? And so what it's showing you is that the frequency um, for low-pass filter, which is this top one, frequency beyond FCO or attenuated, so frequency beyond the, the uh, cutoff, it's going to be attenuated to the point where they're no longer usable. Right. And so let's just let's just make a little bit of sense out of what might be happening here in terms of these two components and this notion of frequency. So if I continue to change the frequency, you know, if I'm looking at the output for a variety of different frequencies <clears throat> and, and sometimes it's easier to just look at um, some extremes. Right. And so if I would look at, let's say, uh, um, you know, I look at my X of L. You know, 2 pi FL, as my frequency goes up, I know that my X of L is going to increase, right? We said that those two are directly proportional. And so if my frequency gets higher, X of L gets higher. Well, we talked about this with resistors. When we had two resistors and we called this a voltage divider. And we said that if you know, they are equal, two equal resistors. Let's just imagine that was a resistor for a second. If these are two equal resistors, then I'm going to get half of the voltage applied across, you know, this, this uh, one resistor, right? If this was a 1K resistor and this was a 1K, and if I had 10 volts, well, since they're both equal, I would have five volts all across this resistor and five volts across this resistor. And so I would get an output of five volts. If I increase this resistor, you know, still thinking like a resistor, if I increase the value of the resistor here, I'm going to get less and less of the percentage of the output across this resistor, right? 
If this was 1K and 1K, okay, I get half and half. If this is 10K and 1K, well, then I'm only going to get a tenth of the voltage here that I would here because it's a tenth of what this resistance is. Now, if this is 100K and this is uh, 1K, well, now I'm only getting a hundredth of the voltage across this resistor that I would get here. My point being, the greater the value of this device resistor, if it was a resistor, the less I'm going to get with output. And you can see as we look at this, this uh, graph, it's saying that I'm measuring across this output and I'm getting a certain amount of voltage and then the voltage begins to drop off and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, we can make some sense out of that because this component, when we start off with small uh, of, of frequencies, small frequencies would cause this to be very small resistance. And so therefore, I'm going to get the majority of the voltage across this resistor. You know, let's think in terms of, of um, you know, kind of extremes. Let's say that this was uh, DC. Well, if it's DC, this coil of wire really is just wire. And there may be a small amount of opposition as soon as the current is building. But once that current builds, this is going to provide almost no resistance at that point for um, this voltage drop, this voltage divider. And so we would have almost all of the voltage dropped across this resistor. And that's going to maintain until we get to the point where the frequency begins to get high enough that now from a percentage standpoint, this becomes a, a significant value, a significant inductive reactance, you know, significant resistance, if you will, compared to this resistor. And that's when you begin to get this bend. And it's going to continue down. You know, this device, this inductor is going to develop, drop more and more of the voltage to the point you get to what we're going to call the 3 dB point, the half power point. Um, and we're going to say that, okay, everything beyond that's not usable. And so we call this a low pass filter because this configuration is really set up for voltages at low frequencies to be felt across this resistor, right? Now, if we go and we look at same two components, a resistor and an, and an inductor. The only difference is now we've switched the configuration. We're, we're still applying this, this uh, AC uh, input, you know, this frequency. Uh, we've got a resistor. It could be the same value resistor, but we're measuring our output across the inductor. And same rules apply. You know, we said that at low frequencies, this provides very little resistance. Well, if that is what I am taking my output across and it provides very little resistance, especially when compared with this resistor, at low frequencies, all of the, the voltage is going to be developed or dropped across this resistor, right? And so, you know, if I've got 10 volts AC um, and it's at a low frequency, then, you know, it may be... Um, 9.9 .9 volts dropped across this resistor and only 0.1 volt, <coughs> excuse me, dropped across the inductor. And what will happen is my frequency increases. <clears throat> so I go from, you know, uh, one Hertz. So one cycle per second <clears throat> to 10 Hertz, you know, 10 cycles per second. 60 hertz, so 60 cycles per second. As I continue to move up, I'm going to get to this, once again, half power point, this you know, uh, negative 3 dB, where my voltage is then usable, and it's going to continue up to the point where I'm getting basically, you know, at a very high frequency, all of the voltage 
compared to the smaller amount of voltage drop across R, you know, a large amount of voltage developed across the inductor, right? And so we would call that you know, a high pass filter because they're going to develop all of this voltage. This voltage is going to be available at high frequencies or this, a low pass filter because they're going to get the voltages across this resistor at low frequencies. <clears throat> and it's all based on this formula, right? This is what's changing. My inductor, I really didn't talk about changing the value of the inductor. You know, really, once we put the inductor in the circuit, typically that's, that's what it is. You know, I mean, we, there are some variable inductors, but you know, in terms of um, inductive reactants, you usually we're looking at that frequency. That's what's changing. And when it when it says pi, is it the three point one four? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Two pi. <clears throat> so that's uh, the normal three point one four. You know, whatever that is. <clears throat> absolutely. Yep. Yep. Good question. <clears throat> you know, here's here's a um, basically the same thing that we just had in terms of uh, those two different circuits. Now I've got, um, once again, this voltage divider with an inductor and a resistor, and I'm looking at my outputs for uh, low frequencies, low pass. We said that's when we're really thinking that our inductor is going to be um, very small uh, inductive reactants, and so we're going to get the majority of the voltage developed here, so that's a low pass. And then since we know that our, uh, as our frequency increases, our inductive reactance increases. And so the high pass, the output is gonna be across the inductor. You know, when we look at that, these arrows are showing you what happens with, you know, this formula X of L equals two pi FL, right? So this formula in terms of, you know, their, um, you know, how, how are they related? <clears throat> What's the official name of the uh, the one with the plus <clears throat> sign and the little squiggle? Yeah, so this is this is indicating that we have an AC power supply, right? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you know the <clears throat> the polarity on this supply is going to continue to change. You know, negative, positive, negative, positive. That, that little sine wave, that's what it's, that's showing us, that we've got that AC. You know, um, <clears throat> these arrows, what they're showing us is that as our frequency decreases, you're know, thinking about low pass, as we've got a lower frequency, our X of L decreases, our inductive reactance decreases, our voltage across the inductor decreases, our voltage across the resistor increases, right? <clears throat> you know, if we think about um, what we already know, you know if I've got an uh, 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 input voltage and I've got two components, I'm going to have uh, some of that voltage developed across component one, some across the component two, and the relationship between how much on each one is dependent on their resistive or in this case reactive reactive values and so that's why you see when we look at frequencies as frequency decreases this is getting smaller inductive reactance less voltage here more voltage here exact opposite holds true for the high pass you know if my frequency increases an increase in frequency means that I'm getting more XOL inductor reactants across this inductor, which means that I've got more voltage developed across this inductor. And that means I've got less um, voltage developed across this resistor, right? You know, it's, it's a, really the same thing we saw with voltage dividers. It's just where they were set, you know, a certain resistive value and so I knew that if it was half and half, it would always be half and half. Or if it was you know, a tenth or whatever it may be. Here, as my frequency changes, it changes what this 
reactance value is. And then that causes the change in the, the output. Yeah, high frequency, more inductive reactance. Low frequency, less inductive reactance. All right, so when we're, we're talking about um, inductive reactance and resistance, talking about those two together, we call it impedance, right? And since we've got a phase shift you know, between resistance and this X of L, uh, we can't just add it together. You know, so there's a little bit of, of math that we have to do uh, to take a look at how do we combine uh, resistance and X of L to get this uh, total impedance, right? And so total impedance is the same as when we were talking about resistance total. Total impedance would be the resistance, resistance slash reactance values of the circuit all combined, knowing that we've got some that are um, out of phase. And so let's see if we got a, so here's what we have. <clears throat> you know, way we can do this is with uh, right triangle math, and we can certainly use that to solve for um, impedance. So let's take a look at a. Okay, I thought they were going to show us. Here we go. I, I like to see it like this so we can actually see it on the screen. Now here, here's what we have. We've got our uh, reactant or our resistance. We keep our resistance down on this x axis because it's, there's really no phase shift. We've got our x of L. This was our inductive reactance, right? And then if I am going to calculate my total impedance, well, my total impedance is this value here. You know, and we can use that, that formula, you know, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared to get us the values. Let's see, they gave us a resistance of six ohms was my resistor. My X of L was eight ohms, right? So if we've got six and we've got eight, we should be able to calculate what our total impedance would be. And so six squared is 36. Eight squared is 64. 36 and 64 should be 100. And so we would take the square root of 100. And so that should be 10, right? So our, our uh, impedance value should be 10. Hopefully we did that. Yep. Right. So six ohms. On the bottom, eight ohms X of L are inductive reactants. Then all we have to do is use the, the uh, right triangle, if A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Or in our case, you know, what works out to be R squared plus X of L squared is equal to Z squared, right? Then I just take the square root. And so I get this six squared plus eight squared is 36 plus 64 or 100. Take the square root of that and I get 10 ohms. Right. All right, so inductors, um, you know, it, it is different. There's a whole lot of things that remain the same. You know, when we're calculating inductance itself, it looks like series and parallel resistors. Uh, in other words, if we've got multiple inductors in a circuit, but when we get to the resistive values, what we call reactants, we're going to have to use, um, you know, our uh, X of L inductive reactance is equal to two pi FL because it's based on frequency and the value of inductance. As that frequency changes, its inductive reactance is gonna change, which gives us some opportunities put, to put those in circuits because they will act differently than just the typical resistor. And when I can put those in, in a circuit with a resistor, it creates some of these opportunities to create what we just saw in terms like of a, um, you know, some of those filter circuits. All right, so let me close that. Okay. 
Let's take a look at this video, especially with something like this. It's good to, to hear it again, uh, maybe hear it from a, a different perspective. And um, I'm not sure how long this is. Let's take a look at this and then we'll talk about it a little bit more afterwards. Welcome to my first video about inductors. So what's an inductor? Generally speaking, an inductor is a device that temporarily stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. Inductors are usually just coils of wire, and one of the basic properties of electromagnetism is that when you have current flowing through a wire, you'll create a small magnetic field around it. So if you coil up a lot of wire, you'll get a stronger magnetic field. When current first starts to flow through the coil, a magnetic field starts to expand, then stabilizes, and then you've got some energy stored in the magnetic field. When current stops flowing, the magnetic field starts to collapse, and the magnetic energy gets turned back into electrical energy. So they're kind of like a temporary storage area for energy. You know how capacitors store energy in the form of a static charge and resist sudden changes in voltage? Well, inductors are very similar. They store energy in the form of a magnetic field and resist sudden changes in current. And if you only learn one thing from this video, Remember, the current in an inductor cannot instantly change. It always lags by a certain amount of time. Now let me give you an example. Normally when you connect a voltage source to a load resistor, the current will be given by Ohm's law. In this case, 10 volts divided by 20 ohms gives you half an amp. And for this demo, I'm going to be using a 50% duty cycle square wave. So half the time you'll get 0.5 amps flowing, and half the time there'll be no current flowing. Okay, so here's the one kilohertz input square wave. And here's the current waveform, also perfectly square. Now watch what happens when I add a five millihenry inductor in series with the circuit. All of a sudden, the square wave isn't so square anymore. There's a little bit of lag in the current. And this is because it takes a certain amount of time to store and release the energy in an inductor. Now let's try that again with a higher input frequency of 10 kilohertz. Now it's even more obvious that the inductor is impeding the sudden changes in current. This happens more and more as I raise the frequency of the input wave. At 100 kilohertz, there is no square wave anymore. It takes a longer time to store and release the energy in the inductor than the time it takes for the input wave to switch from high to low. So in this situation, the inductor is starting to average out the current over time. And this is very useful. It forms the basis of LC low-pass filters, which I'll cover in another video. But just to give you a quick example, if I add a 1000 microfarad capacitor just after the inductor here, I get a very clean DC output from a square wave input. And this is what good power supplies use to smooth out voltage. And to prove to you that all this happens because of expanding and collapsing magnetic fields, I'm going to feed a square wave into this unshielded inductor here and I'm going to use another inductor as a magnetic probe, so I can view any magnetic field changes on the oscilloscope. On top I have the input wave, and on the bottom you can see the magnetic field that I'm picking up as I get closer to the inductor. Finally, inductors have almost no effect on DC. They're basically just pieces of wire with a resistance of a few milliohms. Alright, that's the basics of how an inductor works. Now I've got a couple more videos with more information. Okay, so in that video, one of, the, one of the things I thought was interesting is you could see that square wave, and the big thing was as an increase in frequency, you saw that waveform, that output waveform, begin, begin to change um, over time because the inductor itself was um, providing more and more opposition to the change in current flow, right? And that's exactly what we saw in the formula where we said that you know, inductive reactants, X of L, is equal to 2 pi FL. As we increase frequency, well, we're going to get an increased uh, inductive reactance, that opposition. And so, therefore, we're going to have, uh, instead of that quick change that we saw in the square wave, it begins to clip and turn it almost into a, you know, a sawtooth waveform. And so, that was a, a pretty good uh, demonstration of, of what would happen. All right, so let's go.
You guys see the learning objectives for capacitors? Mm, I just see the mouse. Okay. It's a blank screen. Let's try that again. How about now? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So we talked about inductors, and we said that, you know, that um, – Inductor, the inductance value, <clears throat> we talked about how uh, that opposition to change in current flow, that's what that inductor was doing. It was trying to oppose uh, the change in current. And um, another component that we need to talk about is a capacitor. All right. And so the capacitor uh, we're going to see is is similar. And you heard in our video where it was talking about capacitors that the the it opposes the change in, in voltage. We're going to see that difference here. But before we dive into that, we're going to talk about uh, the term capacitance. Just like we had the inductance, we've got a capacitance value. Um, we're going to look at some of the same things in terms of phase relationship between current and voltage. And we've already looked at a, a saying that indicates that uh, there is a phase relationship. Remember, we talked about Eli, the ice man. And so Eli... Voltage leads current. That was in an inductive circuit. This is going to be current leading voltage. We're going to see that. Um, we're also going to talk about X sub L. And so since so we got, I'm sorry, X sub C, since we got a subscript here of C, that's different than inductive reactants. Now this is capacitive reactants. Uh, we'll take a look at some filter circuits, you know, a capacitor in a circuit, if you will, and we'll talk about RC circuits. So. This is going to follow basically what we just went through with inductors, but we're going to now talk about capacitors and how um, they act in similar circuits. Um, capacitance, the ability of an uh, electronic component to store an electrical charge or oppose the change in uh, this, this charge is going to work to oppose a change in voltage. Uh, it's going to measure, uh, be measured in uh, farad. Um, you know, most of these are going to be very, very small um, amounts of farads. When we talk about, uh, you know, some of these capacitors, they're going to be, you know, uh, pico or nano farads. And so really, really small. Um, when we talked about early on being able to represent some of these very small numbers using uh, engineering notation. This is where, you know, inductors and capacitors, it comes in really handy. Um, Capacitor is going to store electrical charge in the form of an electrical field, the charge up, right? And so we'll take a look at that. Now, there's uh, several factors that uh, impact the capacitance of a capacitor, um, the size of the plates. Now, when we talk about a capacitor, basically what we have are two um, plates, if you will, two areas where we can have a charge collect um, and the size of those plates will uh, increase a capacitor's capacitance, its ability to store charge. You know, if it's got a larger plate, it has a larger potential to store charge. The distance between those plates, the closer to the plates, the more chance that there's going to be uh, an increased ability to store charge. Right. Um, it, there's just a greater um, field effect as you have those plates closer and closer together. And then a dielectric. Now, a dielectric is uh, an insulating material. Uh, basically, this component, what we have is you know, two conductors. We've got two plates. And in between those two plates is this dielectric material and this insulating material. And uh, the, the higher the rating on the insulator, the greater the charge that, that can be stored. Now, the reason that is we're not forcing current to flow through this device plate to plate. So, in other words, the dielectric current will not flow through the dielectric. What will happen is these plates will charge up and then instead of having uh, um, in, uh, electrons flow through that dielectric, 
a dielectric or that insulating material will have um, after it has charged, when the opportunity presents itself, this capacitor will discharge and it will discharge back through the same conductors that it charged with and not through the insulating material, right? And so in terms of what impacts a, a capacitance value of a capacitor, it's those three things. It's the size of the plates, it's the distance between the plates, and it's that dielectric material. Um, when we're charging and discharging capacitors, it follows the same rule in terms of it's going to take five time constants to fully charge or fully discharge. You can see this is exactly the same. You know, I've got 63.2% uh, of my charge over one time constant, 86.5, 95, 98, 92.8, 99.3 over five time constants. Same thing holds true when I'm discharging from zero all the way down to 0.7. You know, that, that is just this capacitor charging and discharging and um, you know, the, the time constants, just a, a way for us to talk about, you know, um, what, is that, what does that value really mean, right? Time constant is equal to R times C. Capacitors, they, they act um, the opposite of inductors and the opposite of resistors in series and parallel. So in other words, when I'm combining capacitors in series, it's gonna be uh, uh, you know, the, the reciprocal of the sum of reciprocals, right? And remember this, when we did this with resistors, we talked about resistors in parallel, we said this was the formula, and we said that the expectation is always smaller than the smallest. You know, remember that's what's gonna take place here is we're gonna get you know, this in, in series, we combine these components together, these capacitors together, we're gonna to get smaller than the smallest versus in parallel where I'm adding these components together, right? I just add them together to get up my total capacitance in parallel. You know, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say that, you know, can help make a little bit of sense out of that. If we think about those components that um, impacted the capacitance of a capacitor, you know, what's increased or decreased. We said one was the distance between the plate, two was the size of the plates. Well, if, let me see if I have a, okay, so let's, let me do this. All right, so if we have, um, so we have capacitors in series, and we said that we take capacitors and we put them in series, and I'm really looking at. <clears throat> And so this is C1 on top, C2 on the bottom. And we said that the things that could really uh, impact the capacitance of you know, a capacitor, one was the distance between the plates, right? And if we get no current flow through this dielectric that's in between, and so I don't have current flow that will you know, go through and, and go through C1 and C2 and then back to the other side. What I have is you know, a charge of both of these capacitors and then they will discharge, right? Well, <clears throat> one of the things I like to think about in terms of if I've got capacitors in series, I'm expecting a capacitor that is uh, of less value, right? It's going to be the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals. Well, one of the things I look at is, okay, let me, let me just look at the distance between this plate. And let's just say that this was, you know, with the current setup, this is negative and this is positive, right? And so we know that this would be negative and this would be positive. And um, 
But if I just look at the outside plates of both of those, right? And so I'm looking at the distance between this negative plate here and well, that's horrible. And the distance between those two plates, right? Well, if I had one capacitor that has a distance, negative plate and positive plate, that's that far apart. And if that is a determining factor, the distance between the plates on how much charge they can hold, then I would say that the capacitance value of two capacitors in series has decreased, right? It is smaller than the smallest. You know, if this was, um, you know, just to keep things simple, I guess, if this was 10 farads and 10 farads, and I would take you know, the reciprocal of the summer reciprocal, and I would come up with, you know, one over 20 farads, divide that into, you know, point, um, five and and you get you know two farads right so it'd be something like two farads you can see that's smaller than either one of these i started off with 10 and 10 well if the distance between these plates is a part of how the circuit is able to maintain capacitance is ab ability to store charge or capacitance then you can see why i would expect in series the distance between this outside plate on one side and the outside plate on the other side is much greater, right? If I was looking at the same concept, and let's say now that we're talking about, um, you know, say, capacitors and in parallel, right? And by the way, this is the schematic symbol for a capacitor, you know, it's going to look a lot like, uh, you know, what we use for cells and a battery, which makes sense because it can charge. You may also see some that have, um, you know, a polarity. And so you'll see a curved section that will indicate the polarity of the capacitor. But if we think about on um, the capacitance and I'm looking at um, this parallel circuit, one of the things that we know holds true is that whatever this voltage is, let's say this was 10 volts. Well, 10 volts is going to be applied to each one of these circuits, right? And so I'm going to have this capacitor and its ability to store 10 volts is going to work in combination with this capacitor and its ability to store 10 volts, right? We know that voltage is common in parallel. So the more capacitors that I add in parallel, they're gonna add up to 10 volts. They're all gonna charge up to 10 volts. And then when it comes time to discharge, you're gonna discharge that, that same uh, 10 volts in the opposite direction. And so therefore, you know, what in essence, what it, it does, right? Let's just, let's just, you know, say that this is the case. What it does is we could say that in many ways, it is like extending the plate on these capacitors because they're all going to charge up to that same voltage, right? It's, it's like extending the plate, if you will, extending the area that can hold a charge and we said that was another ability that would increase capacitance the larger the plates. And so, you know, what, what I wind up with is in this case, you know, my capacitance uh, total is equal to C1 you know, plus C2 plus C3, whereas here where I am, increasing the distance between the plates, which has a negative impact on the capacitance, the ability to store charge, because now that field is not the, doesn't have the same effect. That's when I get, you know, C total is equal to, uh -oh, not DC, C total is equal to one divided by one over C1 plus 
one over C two and so forth, right? All right, so here I've increased the distance between the plates, the outside plates. I expect to get the smaller than the smallest. And when I combine my capacitance, it should be something that's smaller than those individuals. Here I'm increasing the size of the plates because they're all going to charge up to the same 10 volts. So I'm increasing the, the capacitance. Total capacitance is going to be additive, C1 plus C2 plus C3. That makes sense. You guys are quiet tonight. I know we're covering a lot, but let me know if you uh, if I lose you. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. And here's what we said. You know, C total. This is when we got those uh, uh, capacitors that are in series. Here's where we had those capacitors in parallel. Increase in parallel is going to be a decrease in series. Now, capacitive reactants, just like we did with inductive reactants, we had a, capa a capacitive reactants. Remember, inductive reactants was X sub L is equal to 2 pi FL, right? The only thing that's going to change here, we're still going to have 2 pi F, but we're going to change instead of inductance, you know, the value of inductance, we're going to change uh, to capacitance. And then notice that the formula has changed in terms of it is X of C is equal to one over two pi F C. Now, what that means is that my X of C is inversely proportional with frequency and with capacitance, right? So, um, you know, as the frequency increases, my X sub C is going to decrease. As the capacitance increases, my X sub C is going to decrease. They're inversely proportional. Here's what we saw with uh, our uh, looking at our um, sinusoidal waveform. We look at that sine wave representing the uh, voltage and current of um, you know, the, the input and that over the capacitor. Remember the saying was Eli the Iceman. C in the middle indicates we're talking about a capacitor and the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees. Now, it makes sense if we think about we said a capacitor opposes a change in voltage. Okay, if it opposes, if it provides some opposition to a voltage change, then we would expect that it would be delayed. It would do its job somewhat. And so the voltage would change, but it would be delayed, right? So current leads voltage. Just as the inductor provided an opposition for a change in current, well, it does limit the change in current, delays the change in current. So there, voltage led uh, the current by 90 degrees. We've got an opportunity here to calculate our X sub C, you know, one over two pi uh, FC. It's just a matter of plugging in the numbers. If we've got a 20 microfarad capacitor, uh, 20 volt peak to peak signal is 60 Hertz. Right? And so our um, uh, X sub C, you know, our capacitive reactants is based on the uh, frequency and based on the uh, value of the capacitance, 20 microfarad capacitor. And I plug in the numbers, you know, 60 hertz, 20 microfarad. See, here we've got it uh, represented in scientific notation, 20 uh, times 10 to the negative 6. Gives me 0 0.0012 times uh, 2 pi, 6.2H, which is 2 pi times 0 0.0012. Gives a very small number. Divide that uh, into 1. They get 132.6. Notice the, the uh, unit. 
The unit is ohms. I'm not sure I mentioned that when we were talking about inductive reactants. Inductive reactants, the unit is ohms, right? And so we're talking about reactants and, and resistance. They have that same unit, ohms. The Ohm's law doesn't change. The only thing that has changed is this resistance reactance value, this inductive uh, capacitor reactance that's measured in ohms, you know, takes a place of resistance. You know, voltage is equal to current times um, capacitor reactance, right? So we could still solve for anything that we want to solve for. It's just uh, using capacitor reactance versus uh, using uh, strict resistance. I had a question. Sure. Um, it's been a while, but what's the, I forgot the parentheses thing, how do you add, multiply, divide thing? Like the, the, the way the does. Yeah. Okay, say, say that again now. Like the, when you do the parentheses and the addition, like what comes first? Okay, so the order of operations kind of right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's been a long time for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, if we have uh, parentheses, we're going to do that first. Um, you know, that's that's and that's why you see us working through all of this before we actually divide that into one. Um, you know, here, uh, really, the only thing that we have is multiplication inside the parentheses. So we're going to start working here. And then and continue on, right? So we're going to solve inside the parentheses first with multiplication. And then once we get the inside of the parentheses solved, then we'll go in and uh, take the reciprocal of that or divide that into one. Okay, I think. Now for, you know, when we, when we talk about inside this parentheses, this multiplication, does it matter if we multiply 60 hertz times 20 microfarads, or if we multiply 2 pi times 60 hertz first, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, as long as we start here and work, side in, work inside this uh, parentheses, you know, uh, solving this multiplication, um, it, it'll, it'll all work out the same since we're multiplying all those together. Does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. I, th I think it was. The, I think it's called PEM dots or something like that. Just in the whole general. Oh yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in terms of the whole order of operation, um, yeah, we've got a slide coming on that. Okay. Yeah, that's where I was. It's it's, it's not it makes more not, sense. It's not tonight. Um, in fact, well, one second. Let me, let me see if I can find that for you.
Okay, so if, if this is what you're talking about. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and so if you look at here in terms of all, um, you know, please excuse my aunt, dear Aunt Sally, is what they're using for their um, saying, parentheses for please excuse exponent, my multiplication, dear division, aunt, addition, Sally, subtraction. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Okay. Good question. Okay. So let's take a look at, just like we did for a um, inductor, <clears throat> pretty much the same deal. You know, we've got um, a resistor and now a capacitor, a capacitor. So this is a RC circuit. You've got a resistor, a capacitor, low pass filter, and an RC high pass filter. Just to, just to try to make some sense out of this. You know, the big thing is to think about um, that value of X sub C, you know, con, uh, uh, capacitive reactance. Remember, capacitive reactance was uh, 1 over 2 pi FC. So if it's 1 over 2 pi FC, meaning that as frequency increases, my uh, resistive value, my reactance, my capacitive reactance is going to decrease. And so what we see here is that as um, in this first scenario, we are measuring our output across the capacitor, right? And um, we've got high frequency going to a frequency cutoff all the way down to you know, minus 3 dB, so our uh, half power point. Everything else is going to be attenuated. And then as my frequency increases, hmm. So let's think about that for a second. X of C is equal to one over two pi F C, right? Same value of C. And so as my frequency increases, my X of C should decrease. As my frequency increases, yep, my X of C should decrease, right? And I'm measuring my output across my capacitor. Okay, okay. So as I've got some value of uh, voltage here, you know, my input is at a frequency of say, you know, 10 cycles per second, right? And so as I'm progressing 10 cycles per second, I get some value here of, of my um, Wait a minute, I don't, I don't, hold on a second. I don't like the way that's, that's set up. Um, Hold on one sec.
Okay. <clears throat> so let's go back and, and talk about this one more time. So here we have our input, our frequencies, right? And as our frequency increases, we're going to have a low pass because we're going to have more um, voltage developed across this capacitor at lower frequencies than we will at higher frequencies, right? The higher the frequency, the smaller the X of C. And so the higher the frequency, the, the, uh, what happens is, is it starts to attenuate. We get to this half power point, you know, just same, same, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, impact that we had before in terms of, an inductor and a, and a resistor, or talking about a voltage divider with two resistors, you know, here we've got this uh, capacitor that's going to charge up, right? So what's going to happen is, you know, we have um, let's see, let me so let's say we have um, you know, negative and positive, right? So we're talking about electron current flow for us. And now what happens when you get into talking about AC, you know, we can't talk about the whole time because things are changing. So we have to really kind of focus on the polarity looking at a, at a half cycle, right? And so we're gonna start off and electrons are gonna go this way, right? And then electrons are gonna to continue to go this way. Right, so that's just for that half cycle. Now, what that means is that, you know, what we know is these um, negatives and these positives, right? We, we know that those that are, um, just because what we talked about in the beginning about the, you know, uh, the law of attraction and, and the fact that, all of those electrons, right? They are uh, pushed away from um, this negative charged and attracted to this positive charge, right? And so what happens is we get all of these negatives on this plate that are attracted toward this positive charge. So we get an absence of electrons here. They take off and they run over here because they're you know, attracted to this, um, this, this positive charge and we get this uh, absence of electrons. And so you end up with a um, positive charge there. You also have all these, uh, these um, electrons here that are forced this way and you get this, you know, uh, negative. And so what happens, you get this, this capacitor that charges up. Now you don't get electrons flowing through these this device because remember we got a dielectric in here, right? We said the ability of this capacitor to to store a charge was based on you know, one the size of these plates. You know, the larger the plate, the more electrons or absence of electrons. The um, we also said that the uh, distance between the plates, because the closer these plates are. Uh, you know, it impacts what happens here between the two plates, you know, the, the force that's felt. Um, also, uh, we said that this dielectric, you know, we got to have enough of a material in here that opposes current flow. So we don't get current that, that would you know, jump this gap. And so we wind up with this, this device that charges up and it'll charge up to whatever the value is here. And then, on the next half cycle, it discharges, right? And so it's gonna go back and forth, back and forth, charge, discharge, that, that type of, of uh, process. Now, what we have for this low pass filter is at lower frequencies, uh, we're gonna have, this is going to provide more uh, resistance, if you will, right? Capacitive reactants. 
one over two pi FC was the, the formula, right? Um, but when we look at this, you know, one of the things that we can say is we know that this capacitor, if it's made out of uh, a component that has these plates that are close together, but do not allow current to flow between them, uh, if this was a DC uh, supply, then this would charge up and then no current would flow through this anymore, right? And so at a low frequency, DC being the ultimate low frequency, at a low frequency, this would be a, a high uh, X sub C, a high resistive value, you know, a high value of ohms. And so therefore my output would be that I felt across this voltage divider that is created would be pretty high. And you can see it, it's, it's, you know, this peak, whatever it is, and then it begins to drop off as frequency gets to a certain point and it drops all the way down to the point where we say, okay, it's no longer usable. It's that half power point. And that's all because as frequency increases, you know, uh, X of C is equal to one over two pi FC frequency and X of C are inversely proportional. And so it provides less resistance, um, you know, as frequency increases. And so therefore I get la less output across this capacitor. Now, if we, if we switch the components, right? So we've got our capacitor and we've got our resistor. And now we're taking our output over our resistor our capacitor, you know, once again, if we think about in terms of DC, you know, it's going to charge up. No current's going to flow through this thing. It's, you know, it, it basically is going to charge and allow current to flow as it charges. And then that's it. Um, if this was DC, that's, that's an open, right? I mean, that, that once it charges, no more current's going to flow. And uh, all of the um, voltage would be developed across this, this capacitor would be dropped across this capacitor. You know, if this is a, once again, a voltage divider, this value is going to be much greater in terms of uh, ohmic value versus this resistor at low frequencies. Now, as the frequency increases, right? Remember capacitive reactance is equal to one over two pi FC. As frequency increases, my capacitive reactance is going to uh, decrease. And so, you know, at very, very high frequencies, this almost acts like a short because what's going to happen is it's going to charge up and discharge so quickly based on the frequency that um, it becomes closer and closer to a short or you're very, very small in resistance or capacitive reactance value, that ohmic value. And that's what we see with this output here. We're taking our output across our resistor at low frequencies. All of the voltage is really developed. You know, it's all dropped across this capacitor all the way up to, once again, our 3 dB point or you know, half power point. And from there, we get more and more of our voltage or signal developed across our resistor as our capacitive reactance across the capacitor becomes less and less and less, right? So one is a low pass filter. One is a high pass filter. Um, you know, we could do the same thing we did with uh, inductors, resistors, and, and then what we'll, what we'll see as we continue to work toward this notion of a power supply is a combination of inductors and capacitors. Another way to look at uh, RC filters, you know, as our frequency increases because of our formula, X of C is equal to one over two pi FC as our frequency increases, it's inversely proportional with our X of C. And so our X of C is gonna decrease which means our voltage across the capacitor is going to decrease, which means the voltage across the resistor is going to increase. That's what we have right here with the high port of the high pass portion. As the frequency of this input increases, we're going to see everything decrease uh, down here. As the frequency decreases, 
because of our formula and uh, X of C and frequency being inverse to proportional, as frequency in, uh, decreases, our X of C is going to increase, which means our voltage is going to increase. So everything here increases, which means that our voltage developed across our resistor must decrease, right? So high pass versus uh, low pass filters. Uh, same thing holds true for uh, combining resistance and capacitive reactants. We still have to look at impedance. You know, the, the formula is still the same. We're going to draw this a little different since we have our, um, you know, our voltage in, in uh, our current or capacitive circuits our current leading our voltage. So we're going to draw this down the way we do here. And what you're going to see is once again, you know, on the X axis, on the Y axis, uh, you know, it's going to be um, Pythagorean's theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, or you know, R squared plus X of C squared equals or Z squared. And here we had values of, um, 25 and 70, right? so we did a little bit larger values here, um, 625 and 4,900, 55, 25 for a total of 74.33. Now, here's one good thing that you guys obviously are well aware of, the fact that you're not going to have a calculator on the test. You're not going to see uh, any calculations that look like that. All right, so what, um, what they're talking about here is if you wanted to combine uh, resistors, inductors, capacitors in a circuit, uh, you certainly can do that to look at a, um, you know, a, a, a filter and specifically looking at this um, where XLL and X of C and the total impedance of the circuit is the resistor. Uh, the frequency is called the resonant frequency. What they're saying is that if you look at the way we drew um, our X of C and our X of L, there comes a point in time with frequency. I mean, think about capacitors and inductors. Capacitors to capacitive reactants was uh, two pi uh, capacitive reactants one is one over two pi FC. Inductive reactants is uh, two pi FL. There comes a point in time in a circuit, if you have both of those values in a circuit where there's a certain frequency where those two are going to be equal, right? Um, and that frequency is what they're going to call resonant frequency. That's a, that's a, a special frequency. And since you have uh, your uh, X of C and your X of L. Since those two are going in opposite directions, when we drew them, remember when we drew X of L, we went up, X of C, we went down. What happens is those two are equal. They're going to cancel each other out. And the only thing that you're going to be left with is this, uh, the total impedance is going to equal to the resistor, the resistor of the circuit at this special uh, frequency. Um, I don't think you'll be asked about um, resonant frequency. You might, but I, I, I haven't heard anybody come back and ask and say that uh, there was a discussion about resonant frequency. Now, here's an example. We're talking about, let's see, we've got current, our uh, frequencies at the bottom. We've got our resonant frequency listed here. Um, and so you can see the current set, the max at this resonant frequency. And we've got our uh, half power point, our 0.707 at F1 and F2. 
And so we, what, what happens is we create this band pass um, filter so that you're passing basically frequencies from um, 900 hertz to uh, 1100 hertz, it looks like, right? As I said, 900 to 1100, you're above your half power point. Anything below that, you can see is attenuated out either by uh, one component or the other. This is called a band stop um, filter. Basically, what we've done, just like we did with a high pass and a low pass with capacitors and with inductors, where we showed you, depending on where we're taking the output, we could change whether it was a high pass or a low pass. You know, here, instead of giving a band pass where it's passing those bandwidths in the center, now we've, we've changed it so that we are getting um, those frequencies that are on the edges would be passed and those that are in the center are, are stopped, if you will. And so this call this band stop. And so frequencies below, you know, here, this whatever, maybe eight, 800 Hertz to um, 1300 Hertz would be, would be stopped. You know, our, you see our FO, our resonant frequency at a thousand. Okay. <clears throat> so I think we are do a break. All right. We're about um, seven till. Let's take a break until, say, uh, five after. All right.
Okay, let's uh, let's talk about transformers. Now, transformers. So we talked about uh, inductors, capacitors, and now transformers. And transformers are going to take advantage of that same uh, induction, that inductance uh, capability. You know, that notion that in a a conductor where we have current flowing, we'll get a magnetic field around that that conductor. You're going to take advantage of that same, um, you know, characteristic, if you will, of electricity. But we're going to do uh, a couple of different things than just having one inductor with or one set of turns. Uh, we're going to talk about mutual inductance. We're going to look at this notion of turns ratio. And talk about you know, how are that how that plays into voltage and power and current. Um, we'll look at some uses for transformer and and the parts of of a transformer, right? And so when we when we talk about a transformer, if we think about that inductor that we had, where we had uh, you know some core, and it could have been an air core or it could have been some. Uh, magnetic core, but it was an inductor where we had this, this twist or these turns of wire around this core. And what we said was that as we've got current flowing in the wire, we get this magnetic field that is generated around this inductor. Well, this notion of a transformer uh, is taking advantage of that same uh, phenomenon, uh, but we're introducing a second set of turns into that magnetic field. And then we're going to create uh, a current flow in this secondary of the transformer, right? So we've got the primary side that's actually connected to the AC source. And then we've got the secondary. And you can see that it's not connected to the AC or really what's driving current in the secondary is this magnetic field, right? And so this, this uh, notion of putting this uh, other set of turns into this magnetic field and creating this current is called mutual induction, right? So we've got this induction that takes place around one, one set of turns, and then we put another set of turns that fills that, that magnetic field and creates uh, current in the secondary. Now, we can have... Uh, different um, amounts of turns in the primary and the secondary. And we'll, we'll see what that does for this transformer. You know, we may be a step up or a step down. Um, and then the other thing is notice that these turns, you can see that they are wrapped in the opposite directions, which creates a, 180 degrees signal inversion. In other words, uh, the negative and positive, right, is um, rotated. The polarity is switched, right? Okay, so as we, as we look at that previous slide here and kind of uh, attach some names and, and some uh, terminology to this transformer, we have the primary windings, right? So this would be the primary side. And so those primary windings around this core, right? So this is all the primary windings. We have the primary current. So that's the current that's flowing in the primary. You can see it's labeled here as primary current. Yeah, that's the, the primary current is what's generating this magnetic field we have secondary windings, right? So over in L2, remember L was inductor. So L2, we've got these secondary windings and that creates a secondary current based on this mutual inductance from this magnetic field. Oops. And then we got what we call the flux linkage, right? And what they're saying is really in terms of this 
connection between the primary and secondary. These we call these often these magnetic lines of flux, right? And you're not going to get a hundred percent of the turns in the secondary cutting across these magnetic lines of flux. And so there's, there's always going to be some loss that, that exists there. We also talk about that as the coefficient of coupling that, that loss that, that creates, you know, that's created by this um, transformer. It's just always the case. Uh, same thing with the input power. The input power is always going to be greater than the output power. Once again, due, due to this notion of you're always going to have some losses in this process. Um, we talked about mutual inductance and, and what that is. You know, when we get this magnetic field in the primary and it cuts across these turns in the secondary, I get current in the secondary. Um, and, you know, keep in mind as this AC voltage causes these magnetic lines to expand, collapse, expand, collapse, you know, they're going to do the same thing over here. You know, it's going to expand across the L2. Um, you know, it's going to collapse across, you know, from L1 across L2, and it's going to go back and forth, meaning that the polarity is also going to change in the secondary, right? It's, it's not going to be, um, you know, AC in the primary and DC in the secondary direct current. No, I'm going to get this change in polarity in the secondary as well. I'll get AC on the primary, AC on the secondary. Now, they won't necessarily have the same polarity as primary to secondary, but I'm going to get this back and forth, this AC continued back and forth. Um, also notice that uh, in terms of this bold statement here, the closer the two conductors, the greater the mutual inductance, the more the voltage is induced. Uh, you know, that's the same thing that holds true in terms of um, just that, the physical ability, that physical location, you know, the, the closer those two are, uh, the, the more that magnetic field is going to cut across these lines, these turns in the secondary, and the more um, voltage you're going to get in the secondary, and the less losses you're going to have in the secondary. You know, you, if you had a transformer that has, you know, a primary and secondary and they're they're separated by quite a bit then you're going to have more loss than if those two inductors are closer together right this kind of just shows you walking you through that that what takes place with that uh, transformer <clears throat> you know, we've got current that's going to flow in the primary as current flows in the primary we get our magnetic field that develops that magnetic field cuts across the secondary. It induces current in the secondary. This counter EMF is induced, and then current flows in the secondary. Right. So I mean, that's that's what's taking place with this transformer action. It's it's um, current creates that magnetic field. Magnetic field cutting across those uh, secondary turns that creates uh, current in the secondary. Transformers are designed for different applications. You, know, you may have transformers that work at, uh, you know, amp versus microamp range. Uh, one thing about transformers is they are heavy, bulky. Um, and if you think about electronic components and devices now, uh, you know, everything is smaller, smaller, smaller. And so you don't use a lot of transformers um, unless you need them, right? I mean, you wanna, you wanna get away from the weight, you wanna get away from uh, the expense. Uh, so they're you know, not used as, you know, used only as, only as necessary. Uh, a couple of different transformer symbols. You see the schematic symbol here. We got a primary or secondary or core in the middle. Um, there's that's an iron core. This is a typical transformer what it would look like you know primary leads or secondary leads remember primary leads that's what's connected to the ac input 
secondary. That's where our output, uh, we're going to take our output from. And then we've got, uh, this is, um, this is cardboard or ceramic core or even, you know, air core, um, that schematic symbol. Primary, once again, secondary. And this is a little bit, you know, this is probably the most common that you'll see. Turns ratio. And so when we start thinking about the turns ratio, we're talking about the, the number of turns in primary and number of turns in the secondary, you know, and how we, how we look at those turns and, and what those turns will actually do or indicate, you know, um, we may have same number of turns in the primary and secondary, which, you know, sometimes you do that uh, as a isolation transformer. In other words, you've got same turns in the primary, same turns in the secondary. And so you expect something in the secondary, very similar to what you had in the primary, but it's isolated from the AC input, right? I mean, you actually uh, see that in the medical world some. You've got um, primary, a transformer where you have more turns in the primary than you do the secondary. If you've got more turns in the primary, than the secondary, then that's going to be a step down transformer. And basically what a, what a step up or a step down transformer means is that uh, the voltage is going to be greater or less than uh, either in the primary or the secondary. If you have a step up transformer, meaning you've got more turns in the secondary than the primary, Right, step up, then you're going to have more voltage in the secondary than the primary. If you've got a step down transformer, meaning you've got more turns in the primary than the secondary, then you're going to have more voltage in the primary than the secondary. Right. So it's either usually either going to be a step up or a step down transformer. Right. So here, here we have a couple different transformers. Uh, you can see that our primary side, once again, is connected to our AC input. Our secondary side, uh, you know, here it's connected to a voltmeter. Um, we've got in this first case, 100 turns in the primary, 200 turns in the secondary. So we've got more turns in the secondary. So this should be a step up, right? More turns here it means that we're going to go from a smaller voltage to a greater voltage. We're going to increase the voltage step up transformer. 100 turns to 200 turns. If we've got twice as many turns in the secondary, then we're going to have twice as much voltage, right? This was our voltage primary was 110 volts AC, right? So if we've got 110 volts across, you know, 100 turns, then if we've got 200 turns in the secondary, twice as many turns, then we're going to have two times as much voltage, right? So our voltage in our secondary is going to be 220 volts AC, step up transformer. We went from 110 volts to 220 volts. Now, power, you know, it, it, it's, it's, um, we're going to have some power losses. And so, you know, theoretically, it's not going to remain exactly the same. However, in terms of voltage times current, um, we're, we're going to treat it as it remains the same. Meaning, what I mean by that is, as my voltage increases, it goes from 110 volts to 220 volts, my current is going to decrease, right? So my current is going to go from one amp in the primary to a half a amp in the secondary. You know, if, I, if I took my power formula, power is equal to current times voltage. And so 110 times one amp, I'm going to get 110 watts. Well, if my voltage increases to 220 volts in the secondary and my power for all our practical, practical purposes is going to remain the same, 
if this doubled, then my current's going to be in half, right? And so if I do the same math, 220 volts times 0.5 amps gives me 110 watts, right? And so my, my current is staying um, the same, even though, uh, sorry, my power is staying the same, even though uh, I know that I'm going to have some power loss because of this coefficient of coupling, that loss. Now, second example, start off with 2,000 turns. So if I got 2,000 turns in the primary, I think that says terms, right? that should be 2,000 turns in the primary and 500 turns in the secondary, right? And so I've got you know, a quarter the number of turns in the secondary. This is a step down transformer, right? I've got a uh, hundred volts, that's 2000 turns, but now I've only got 500 turns. So I've got a quarter of the turns. So I'm gonna have a quarter of the voltage or 25 volts AC. This is a step down transformer, right? A step down transformer. Now, if power is going to remain the same, Right. Current times voltage, we had 100 volts and one amp, so that was 100 watts. Well, if this is now 25 volts, well, then I've got four amps. And so you can see that my, my current has actually increased. My voltage is uh, 25 volts. This is a step-down transformer. The third type of transformer we have here, uh, notice that both of these, now this one has a line in the middle indicating a center tap, but we're, we're not using it, right? So both of these are using um, the outside, all the turns of the, uh, the secondary, and it's connected across all the turns of the secondary. Now here, what we have is um, a center tap. And what that does is we use this for a reference. We're gonna measure our output from uh, you know, pin three here to pin four, and then also pin five to pin four. And you can see if, you know, say that this was negative, or actually let's, let's say a, a toward in the same direction as the drawing. Let's say this is negative, this is positive. Well, you see my output I get, you know, this one's going negative, this one's going positive. And so this is a center tap transformer. We get two signals in amplitude and opposite polarity. We're actually gonna use a center tap transformer as we start getting into our power supply, uh, we're gonna see how we can use a center tap transformer to take advantage of um, this, this power supply and, and what we can do there. But you can see, I, I get an input. And from that input, I'm gonna get, uh, once again, that mutual induction is gonna take place, primary windings across this iron core, and secondary windings, it's just instead of taking one output from top to bottom of the secondary, now I'm taking two outputs with a reference point in the middle. So half the windings and the other half of the windings. And using the reference point in my center tap, it gives me this you know, two separate windings or two separate outputs one going in a negative uh, polarity, one going in a positive polarity, right? We'll see more about center tap. The big thing right now is, is that uh, step up transformer, step down transformer. And know, to, know that voltage is gonna follow that step up or step down transformer. Uh, we won't have to worry a whole lot about impedance matching, but when we talked about impedance before, remember impedance was really uh, that notion of um, the ohmic value. And when we're looking to maximize power, 
we want to match impedance, match the the uh, <laughs> ohmic value from stage to stage. <clears throat> anyway, somebody have a question? Okay. Um, transformer efficiency, we talked a little bit about that. The, the ratio of output power uh, divided by the input power will always be less than one. We're always going to have some losses, some power losses due to the, in, uh, the uh, inefficiencies in the transformer. I'm not saying that we're going to lose a lot, but I'm just saying that there will be losses. There will always be some losses. Okay. Questions about transformers. No. All right, thanks, Nate. Okay. All right, so the last thing that uh, just to talk about tonight is uh, solid state power supplies. You know, basically, we're going to look at four sections of a power supply, and uh, we're going to talk about those, those functions. And these are, uh, this is going to be a um, pretty quick overview, I think, through this presentation. And then we're going to use each one of the uh, sections to talk about uh, a little bit more in detail uh, over uh, maybe two days or something like that. Um, so when we talk about a, a power supply, you know, and we, we talked a little bit about this when we started going into AC, the fact that so many of our devices around, you know, your home require DC, you know, they're designed to run on DC internally uh, however your um, power is provided to your house ac right and so you've got a uh, ac source but you need a dc source uh, to run many of your devices and so there there must be something that is taking place with um, your um, devices you know, whatever that could that that is uh, there must be something that's taking place to to make sure that based on your you know, 120 volts AC coming into your home at 60 hertz, that your um, you know TV has the right voltage to uh, to properly operate. You know your lamps have the right voltage. Um, your um, your know, computer has the appropriate voltages to, to operate. And so there's, there's something that's taking place in that power supply, that DC power supply, that solid state power supply that allows this to, to occur. And that's what we're going to kind of take a block diagram look at you know, what occurs to ensure that your devices have the appropriate voltages that they need. If we look at just a, a four block you know, solid state power supply. We label those A, B, C, D and start off with the input that looks you know, like this AC sine wave coming into block A and it is headed to this steady volts DC output so that whatever device needs to run can run. Uh, yeah, that's what we're gonna talk about. You know, and block A, we, we really, just hit on is this transformer, right? And so this notion that we're gonna have our AC input, you know, typically in our homes, 120 volts, 60 Hertz input coming into uh, you know, this, this transformer. And then that is going to provide some output 
based on what type of output is needed and what type of you know, the transformer is going to be put in place to determine what is needed, right? Um, let's see if there's anything that um, remember in terms of the transformer, you know, step up or step down, right? Uh, typically for most of our devices, it's, it's stepping it down 120 volts, stepping that down to uh, usable voltage. However, uh, you may have cases where that 120 volts is stepped up as well. Um, you know, block B, you, know, you see these uh, outputs that are above each one of these blocks. So block A was our incoming uh, you know, AC sine wave, uh, it was here, it was a step down. You can see this AC sine wave looks smaller. It doesn't have the same amplitude. You know, it's not the same value peak to peak. Um, the voltage has been dropped, it's smaller. Uh, but it's still, as we mentioned, after the transformer, you know, it is still um, AC. You know, maybe it's 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 closer to the right voltage that we need, but it's still AC, and so it's still not usable. If we look at block B. Block B is a, a what we call a rectifier. Uh, the function of the rectifier is to change this AC to uh, what we're going to call a pulsating DC, right? And so we get now you can see this um, instead of a sine wave, we get this. Uh, DC and the reason I, I say DC, which you know it's it's debatable whether it's DC, at least it all has the same polarity, right? And so we had you know this uh, waveform that's going say uh, going positive comes back to zero and then it changes polarity and goes to some negative peak and then back to zero. Um, that you know that has cur current moving in opposite directions, changing back and forth. And some of our devices, that's okay, but there's some devices that will not uh, operate with current changing directions like that. Okay, so we got uh, you know, B is the rectifier. We're getting everything moving in the same direction, right? At least it's all. It may go from zero to let's just say that, you know that's that's you know zero to twelve volts, but at least it's all going in the same direction. Zero back up to twelve. Zero to back up to twelve, and and we're not moving in an opposite direction. That's still that's still not. Um, a usable DC for most of our devices. However, at least we were stepping closer. At least we're not, not changing polarity now. Then we're going to look at a filter. You know, this, this filter, basically what we're doing is we're trying to uh, filter out these, uh, this ripple, right? So filter out these big humps going, uh, you know, from zero to some peak value. And instead, let's have this uh, say this is at um, you know 12 volts and it drops down to 11.5 and it's back up to 12 and 11.5 and so now you can see while it's not a clean DC it's still you know varying a little bit it's nowhere near as much as it was here right the polarity is right we're moving closer to a solid DC but it's not um, not there yet we still got some noise if you will, in that signal. And then finally, we get to block D, which is a regulator, right? And a regulator, this is a device that will, <clears throat> excuse me, that will take in a voltage and given a voltage will, will give a clean output, you know, based on whatever that, that voltage regulator is rated at, right? And so we get this, you know, input, Maybe it's going from 11.5 to 12, 
and it's going to give us a solid, you know, 10 volts out or nine volts or five volts or whatever it may be. And so we can feed this input into this regulator and it's going to give us a steady voltage DC that will run whatever my device is uh, that needs to be run. All right. So those are, those are the four blocks that we're going to look at and we're going to step through, um, you know, B, C, and D. I mean, we'll take a look at, at A, but we, we briefly talked about the transformer. Um, we'll look at it and circuit, but we're also going to look at uh, B, C, and D, the rectifier, the filter, and the regulator, looking at the components that we already know and seeing those schematics as to uh, what those will look like. Okay. All right, so that, that brings us to the end of our material that we needed to cover today. Uh, I know we hit a lot of ground bringing three new components in between inductors, capacitors, and transformers, uh, all talking about AC and with all different ways that we need to calculate, whether it be inductance, or capacitance, or inductive reactants, or capacitive reactants, or even uh, you know the notion of phase shift. You know, Eli, the Ice Man. So we we covered a lot of ground, and we talked about a lot of things. Um, there are some videos. <clears throat> there's a, um, a video on inductors. There's a video on uh, capacitors, um, transformers. Uh, even solid state uh, power supplies, all, all four of those have a YouTube video associated with them that you can go out and watch. Um, you know, I'll say that it, at least it gives you some more information. Um, and, and, you know, the, in terms of the calculations, you know, be aware but once again, I, I don't see a whole lot of, you know, the in-depth calculations on the TKT. It's just something that um, you guys need to need to understand those different components and be aware of those, those different components, at least from a, uh, a recognition standpoint. So let me, uh, let me just open it up. We're at, uh, looks like 20 to the hour. Um, any questions about what we've covered tonight or, um, any other questions? I did a whole lot of talking tonight, and you guys were pretty quiet. So um, I hope that means that you guys are, are still okay. Okay, so I see where... Uh, Justin's talking about the, the videos. Um, yes, I mentioned that uh, toward the beginning, and I'll, I'll just show that again for those that um, may have popped in after. Uh, if you go to your uh, course, so you where you guys can log in your tech training, and then if you go to the end of a session, so if, for example, session four, you know, this is at the end of session four, uh, you can see it's session five starts right here. Uh, I put at the end of the very end of the session, 
This is video recording of you know, session one, session two, session three, and session four so far. You know, I will put session five in um, likely tomorrow. It takes a little bit of time for it to um, be available, but I'll put section five in. And so they'll be at the end of each one of these uh, sessions, if you will. And this may look a little bit different than yours. Um, if so, you should be able to go click session one. It should give you, uh, you know, everything that's in session one. You should be able to uh, scroll down. And at the end of session one, you'll see it there, video recording of session one. Anybody else have any questions? No, I'm good. Okay. Okay. Uh, don't forget there are uh, quizzes, right? So go in and uh, make sure you guys do the quizzes. Once again, not, not for my benefit, you know, not for uh, grading purposes. It's all for uh, your benefit and um, you know, use it as a learning tool. So, so do those quizzes. It might generate some questions that, that you have. Uh, if you run into anything, let me know. Um, also, uh, you know, as we get a little bit closer, uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, doing some things with those assessments that are, are out there. You guys are more than welcome to go in and start uh, practicing on those assessments. And um, is there like a, uh, a practice TKT on here? I haven't seen that one. Uh, yes, there should be. Let's see. Let me see if I can find it right. Let's quick. scroll down through all the lessons. It's just. Hold on a sec. Let me see if I can find it. So, uh, yeah, it's in there. I think it's, it's hidden right now from you guys, but uh, I'll go ahead and make that available as well. That, okay. that practice TKT, there's, there's two of them. Um, you know, they are not um, – you know, that's – I wouldn't take those and say, okay, this is the test, and if I can do these, then, then um, you know, and try to memorize those questions. Those are just um, the types of questions, right? And so – uh, use those as, once again, uh, a learning tool. But I'll, I'll turn those on for you. Appreciate you. Anybody else have anything? All right. Well, uh, we're at a quarter till. I'll go ahead and uh, turn you guys loose. Uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you guys. You. Recording stopped.